Development and Alumni Relations here at Union Theological Seminary. And welcome to Union's uh, Union at Home's book launch for Dr. Gary Dorian's newest book, American Democratic Socialism, History, Politics, Religion, and Theory. Applause. <laughs> Bravo, right? The Union at Home Festival is a series of events each fall that safely brings the Union family together to celebrate what makes this community special. Programming includes opportunities to connect with anniversary classes and affinity groups. You get to learn more about our stu uh, Union students' experience and participate in a various community-wide virtual activities and events. Um, tonight, following, we're going to have a Q&A following the discussion. And if you all can see this here, um, we're trying something new because of COVID times. Um, you may not want to remove your mask, but please text this number here that's in front of you. It's 646, and I'll say it slowly, so I'll start again. Uh, 646-397-2000. And again, slower this time, 646-397-2000. Six, 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 four, four. So there will be times, there will be time for Q&A. And for our friends who are online, don't worry about the number. You can just um, write your uh, questions in the chat as normal, and we'll make sure we get to as many questions as we possibly can. So, I'm standing between you and the program, so without any further ado, allow me to introduce our president, Dr. Serene Jones. Dr. Serene Jones, a highly respected scholar and public intellectual. The Reverend Dr. Serene Jones is the 16th president of this historic Union Theological Seminary in the city of New York. The first woman to head the 185-year-old institution. Again, applause. <laughs> okay, so y'all are catching on now, so I probably won't have to say that cues anymore, so thank you for that. Uh, the first woman to head this 185-year-old institution, Jones occupies the Johnston Family Chair for Religion and Democracy. She is the past president of the American Academy of Religion, which annually hosts the world's largest gathering of scholars of religion. Dr. Jones came to Union after 17 years at Yale University, where she was the Titus Street Professor of Theology at the Divinity School and the chair of, of the university's uh, program in women, gender, and sexuality studies. She is the author of several books, including Trauma and Grace, and most recently her memoir, Call It Grace, Finding Meaning in a Fractured World. Dr. Jones is a popular public speaker. It's sought by the media to comment on significant societal issues because of her deep grounding in theology, politics, women's studies, economics, race studies, history, and ethics. And I introduce to some and present to others, Dr. Serene Jones. <laughs> So it's great to see people actually in the social hall, I mean, in the, in the chapel here gathered together. Um, just a quick word of explanation. Um, last time we had an event like this um, and invited the union community uh, that's on campus, the larger union community, and in particular DSA, we had a huge packed room. Um, but this year, uh, because of COVID, we limited uh, this occupancy to 60, and that's why we have um, over 300 people online. But I say especially to all those DSA friends who are watching online, we can't wait to have you back in this space. Um, and that's true for everyone who can't be with us because you didn't get on the list fast enough of those who could come in. So, And please uh, send your questions. Um, so I want to um, start us off by um, introducing um, these two who need no introduction at all um, and then tell you how the evening's going to go. Um, so this evening, um, first, um, Gary Dorian is going to speak, um, then Cornell West uh, will say a few words, 
Um, I will follow that with a few words and then we'll have a discussion between the three of us. Um, so, uh, Gary Dorian. Um, how do you begin to describe Gary Dorian? He teaches social ethics, theology, and philosophy of religion as the Reinhold Niebuhr Professor of Social Ethics here at Union. And he's also a professor of religion at Columbia University. For this, he was the professor at Kalamazoo College, who taught for 18 years, years and served as the dean of the Stetson Chapel and director of the Liberal Arts Club. He is the author of over 20 books, and it's actually probably closer now to 30 because it was just a very, very extremely prolific writer. Um, and each one of those 20 is about this. Um, he's also the author of the three art art of the same rank of social ethics, philosophy, theology, political, economics. Um, so that he can't not speak with and a on ethical engagement with the topic. I'm also happy to introduce this to you, Cornell West. Um, to find the words put out Cornell West. Cornell in the United States today. He is a voice, uh, provocative, and engaged, and alive, and an ongoing, very grounded, and in the midst of our political life of the universe, for what the future can hold for us, and how we understand better what the right path as we are as comes with us. Um, Cornell has also um, written over uh, 20 books. He's edited many, many books. Um, he's best known, I, since I've read all of his books by Gary, but it's hard to choose which one's the highlight. The Race Now, Democracy Now, um, his memoir, he represents his brother West, Living and Loving Out Loud. And his most recent book, Black Fire, offers an uh, unflinching look. At 19 to 20 leaders and their visionary legacy. He is now here um, at Union Theological uh, Seminary right here. as the deepest uh, long uh, of philosophy. Um, to open us with some comments about his amazing book. Thank you, Serene. To be joined tonight by my cherished friends, Serene Jones and Cornell West, <clears throat> was my fantasy version of how this event might go. <laughs> For weeks, this day has been marked on my calendar and in my feeling as an occasion of joy and gratitude. And then came the tragic and devastating news that we have lost Luke Severe. How to carry on with an event like this in the midst of intense grief is hard to know. I hold in my heart those of you who are joining us tonight despite this terrible grieving and the many others who cannot join us because of it. I am deeply grateful for this event to Serene and Cornell and to Kevin Bentley, Ian Reese, and Rita Walters. Serene was a legendary teacher and theologian at Yale Divinity School before she came to Union to save our scrappy, independent, one-of-a-kind seminary. <laughs> Union was at a crossroads when she came here. And today, Union is thriving, chiefly because of Serene. Cornell has been in my head and heart through my entire career, <clears throat> as I will elaborate in a moment. <clears throat> I have one more prefatory word before I get rolling on this talk, <clears throat> because Eris McClure is here tonight. Eris is my beloved partner. She grew up in Tel Aviv, Israel, 
and West Hartford, Connecticut, but she is 100% New York City. <laughs> Eris loves the blues. Pretty hard rock. Numerous bluesy, jazzy folk blends. And above all, bluesy rock. <laughs> I cannot imagine her living anywhere except New York City. But this will be tested in our golden years. <clears throat> And my love, I think we will need to spend more time on Beale Street in Memphis, where they pretty much invented bluesy rock. In the 1970s and 80s, I was an organizer and chapter leader in four social justice organizations. In 1986, I wrote a book about democratic socialism. And in 1990, after I belatedly became an academic, I wrote a book about Christian socialism and liberation theology. The first book built up to a concluding chapter on the theory and politics of economic democracy, especially the Meidner Plan in Sweden, which was fully underway in 1986. The second book built up to a concluding chapter on Cornel West and Rosemary Ruther, my two lodestars. Today, I wince at the clunky style in which these books were written, but the positions I developed way back then were so close to what I expound in the new book that they raise a question. Have I had any new thoughts in the past 30 years? <laughs> it feels like I acquire new thoughts all the time. But I have stuck to a core perspective. I wrote this new book because there is no political and intellectual history of the entire US American democratic socialist tradition, and it was getting late for me to try it. Two years ago, I wrote a big book on European socialism. It poured out of me because I was eager to get to the US American story. I am mindful that I developed my perspective during an abysmal era when mass movements for social justice were so impossible, they were impossible to imagine. Neoliberalism was utterly dominant. TINA was the ruling acronym. There is no alternative. The socialist left cratered everywhere except one place, the academy, a new place for the left. All of that changed after the financial crash, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, the Standing Rock protest, the first Bernie campaign, the election of Donald Trump, the election of AOC, and the second Bernie campaign. Today, the Republican right is driven by white nationalist fear and loathing of being replaced. The Democratic Party is trying to hold off an upsurge of democratic socialism in its ranks. And democratic socialism is surging because there had damned well better be an alternative to white nationalism, severe inequality, and destroying the earth. The USA has a rich, complex, frustrating, and still promising legacy of democratic socialism. It has the richest cultural history of democratic socialism in the world. It has a substantial intellectual and political history in which Christian socialism has been far more important than scholarship on this subject conveys. But the USA did not have a real labor movement back when it mattered. It just had unions, mostly racist, sexist, nativist craft unions that divided workers from each other, fatally truncating the kind of socialism that was possible. U.S. American socialism had all the magical thinking and white supremacism that go with being U.S. American and trying to make socialism speak American. The USA had vibrant, radical democratic traditions before and after Europeans invented socialism. New York disciples of British socialist Robert Owen founded the world's first labor party in 1829, contending that industries and land should belong to everyone. European socialists poured into the US after the liberal revolutions of 1848 were put down and socialists had to flee. 
German-American Social Democrats founded the Socialist Labor Party in 1877, along with a smattering of native-born anarchists and Marxists. Christian socialism sprawled across the nation in the 1880s and 90s, often taking a populist form. Very soon after the Socialist Party was invented, founded in 1901, it was a wondrous stew of radical Democrats, neo-abolitionists, Marxists, Christians, populists, feminists, trade unionists, industrial unionists, single taxers, anarcho-syndicalists, and Fabians. Jewish New York socialists from Russia and Russian Poland espoused a universalistic creed in Yiddish. Rebellious tenant farmers in Oklahoma, red populists in Texas, syndicalist miners in Colorado and California, and socialists across the Midwest and West built a sprawling network of periodicals, summer camps, and state parties. The first hope of radical industrial unionism, the Knights of Labor, a union with no color bar and no xenophobic restrictions, was founded by Christian socialists. They got pulled into more strikes than they could handle, and they learned bitterly that state government stood ready to smash them. This pitiful story recurred over and over. Workers would pull together, strike for their rights, take beatings from hired thugs, cheer when government forces showed up, and discover to their horror that the government did not come to restore order. The first great U.S. American socialist leader, Eugene Debs, became a socialist after the U.S. Army destroyed his union, the American Railway Union. The U.S. Constitution established a simple majority system in which a party receives no representation if it does not win more votes than all other parties within a constituency. Simple majority representation in single-member districts compels voters not to waste their vote. The plurality model of representation turned the nation into a two-party fiefdom of capitalist parties that thwarted third parties. There are almost no exceptions in the world to the rule that a simple majority single ballot system creates two-party fiefdoms. Many have argued that U.S. American socialists would have floundered anyway under proportional representation because socialism was no match for America's open borders, prosperity, and upward mobility. Indeed, many U.S. American workers did fear that socialism would prevent them from getting ahead. But the USA had far more than enough suffering and exploitation to create a surging socialist movement. The number one problem for US American socialists was that divide and conquer worked in the USA. Workers were turned against each other, pitting native born workers in the craft unions against unskilled immigrant workers and excluding black Americans, women and Asians. U.S. American unions were founded separately from political parties and became part of the system of political control represented by the two-party system. Socialist union leaders stumped for a socialist labor party, but they never topped 38% in the AFL. Karl Marx perceived that this exceptional characteristic would be very difficult to overcome. Debs excoriated the socialists who tried to win the AFL to socialism, spurning them as sellouts for scaling the ranks of a shabby union movement. The Debs, socialism was the cure for all social problems and was not to be sullied by reform movements or mediocre trade unions. He was the apostle of a true way that found strength in its purity a Protestant redemption strategy soaked in the idioms of American revivalism. Being a romantic U.S. American individualist made Debs a fabulous campaigner. He loved the workers, and they loved him back, but he made it hard for them to join his party, and he spurned the strategy that worked in England. 
forming a coalition party of the democratic left. This wondrous Debsian socialism was destroyed in 1917 and 1919. The Socialist Party bravely opposed World War I and paid a horrific price for it, viciously persecuted by the government. Then the meteor of world communism crashed into the party and just blew it apart. The Debsian heyday ended in shattered despair, yielding the dismal run-up to Norman Thomas socialism, as it was called. Norman Thomas epitomized social gospel socialism. He was a Presbyterian minister who graduated from Union Seminary, joining the Socialist Party in 1917 because it opposed intervention in World War I and the Presbyterian Church did not. Norman Thomas socialism was a three-sided struggle to renew the democratic socialist idea, hold off the Communist Party, and get a farmer labor socialist progressive party off the ground. Always, the industrial unions played the leading role in pushing for a labor party. In 1924, the forces that needed to come together briefly did so for one election, running progressive U.S. Senator Robert La Follette for president. It helped that the AFL came aboard to punish the Republicans and Democrats. But the AFL had not changed. Backing La Follette was a one-off affair. The dream of a labor party stayed out of reach, condemning socialists to years of futility, kept afloat by garment union money. The farmer labor socialist progressive coalition was never hard to imagine. It haunted the left because every election produced political victors who did not represent vast sectors of the population. W.E.B. Du Bois, Reinhold Niebuhr, and John Dewey shared the dream that the left would pull together. In 1935, Thomas dragged the Socialist Party into solidarity work with the fledgling Southern Tenant Farmers Union. It grew rapidly and adopted a black church hymn, We Shall Not Be Moved. Thomas risked his life by speaking to terrorized sharecroppers in Arkansas. He pleaded for a meeting with Agriculture Secretary Henry Wallace, who turned him down. Thomas despised Wallace for the rest of his life, which was fateful in the mid-1940s when Wallace became a leading anti-anti-communist, and Thomas spurned him for that reason, too. For a while, the Great Depression rewrote the script on what might be possible. Union activism rebounded dramatically, Congress passed the Wagner Act of 1935, and communists and socialists organized the CIO. The Wagner Act threw the weight of government behind union organizers, forcing employers to allow their plants to be unionized. Franklin Roosevelt endorsed it shortly before it passed, co-opting a tide of left-wing and populist forces. He did it with wily brilliance, putting lefty leaders on his payroll, favoring select 30 party candidates over Democrats, telling them he was on their side, determined to transform the Democrats into a progressive party. The New Deal enacted 90% of the socialist platform. FDR hadn't run on any of it. He borrowed all of it from the socialists. To a considerable degree, the New Deal was a form of socialist deliverance which made the socialists look irrelevant. Thomas was eloquent, personable, astute, courageous, and not cut out to be a party leader. He symbolized the shift of the Socialist Party from being primarily working class to primarily a vehicle of middle class idealism. For 40 years, he and A. Philip Randolph stood at the center of democratic socialism. The lack of interest by scholars in Christian socialism has yielded accounts that do not explain how African Americans and feminists came into the movement through it. Social democracy and populism were the two main highways into American socialism. 
Christian socialism was the third, and much of the populist movement was Christian socialist. The Thomas generation of Christian socialists included Mordecai Johnson, Kirby Page, J. Pius Barber, Walter Mulder, Benjamin Mays. They believe that the best forms of Christian theology and ethics are democratic socialist, and they passed this conviction to Martin Luther King Jr. The last hope of a labor party was lost in the whiplash post-war reactions of 1946, 47, 48. The unions had grown from 3 million AFL members in 1935 to 14 million AFL and CIO members in 1945. Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act over Harry Truman's veto to make them weak again, abolishing almost every tool that built the unions, outlawing jurisdictional strikes, wildcat strikes, solidarity strikes, secondary boycotts, secondary and mass picketing, closed shops, and union contributions to federal political campaigns. Taft-Hartley gave state legislatures a green light to enact Orwellian right-to-work laws having nothing whatsoever to do with the right to work. The last hope of a Labor Party died with Truman's feisty comeback victory of 1948. Now, the defanged labor movement belonged wholly to the Democratic Party. In 1958, Thomas reluctantly admitted a group of former Trotskyites into the Socialist Party, fearing that they would take it over, which they promptly did. <clears throat> These were the Shackmanites, disciples of Max Shackman, a former disciple of Leon Trotsky. The Shackmanites were brainy, cunning, scholastic, aggressively parasitic, fiercely ideological, consumed with the right kind of anti-communism, which they called anti-Stalinism, and at every historical turn, exceedingly strange. <clears throat> they were still Leninists when they broke from Trotsky in 1939, and they were more Leninists than they claimed when they morphed in the mid-1950s toward democratic socialism. To them, Thomas was boring, and Shackman was exhilarating. Michael Harrington was their youthful star. Brilliant, energetic, and charming, he befriended Bayard Rustin and brought Shackmanites into the civil rights movement. Rustin and Harrington organized civil rights demonstrations, and in 1960, Harrington and Rustin helped the Shackmanites overtake the Socialist Party. Both of them were dedicated to keeping secret that Martin Luther King's social gospel was democratic socialist. Harrington was appointed the successor to Debs and Thomas, a title he didn't deserve until he broke from the Shackmanites in 1972 and broke up the Socialist Party. The Shackmanites had a vision of a realigned Democratic Party that supported the Civil Rights Movement, abolished Taft-Hartley, and drove out the Dixiecrats. They were done with the warhorse doctrine that socialists should never ally with bourgeois parties. They claimed that the Democratic Party was becoming a labor party in disguise. Shortly after the Shackmanites swung the Socialist Party behind this strategy, a group of college students in Ann Arbor, Michigan proclaimed that a new left was needed. The, the leaders of Students for a Democratic Society, SDS, lumped together all the competing groups and ideologies of what they derisively called the old left. Thomas got a pass, as did Harrington at first, but SDS spurned old left fights over Marxism, communism, unions, and the working class. To SDS, the old lefties sounded too much alike, not fathoming what it was like to be a college student in 1962. The new left was born in a fractious relationship with the old left while depending on funding from it. The old left, being cast as old and bygone, denied that privileged college students who never learned their Marxism had anything to teach them. 
The drama of the early 1960s pitted hardened survivors of the 1930s against gently raised youth of the 1960s. It built to a spectacular crash as SDS and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee both imploded, leaving the old left to say, I told you so. The black new left struggled with the role models it inherited from the 1950s, while the white new left was too alienated to find any. The economic boom of the post-World War II era ran out, yielding a structural economic shift and its miserable combination of stagnation and inflation. Stagflation defied Keynesian correction and the bitter ideological divides in the Socialist Party just blew it apart in 1973. The Shackmanites bridled at the anti-war movement, black power and radical feminism. Harrington led a faction of progressive Social Democrats into a new organization called the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, DSOC. Meanwhile, he argued that the trajectory of the Shackmanites represented something way too important not to name. He called it neoconservatism, a tag that stuck. The Shackmanites and Cold War liberals he named went on to enormous success, winning high positions in three Republican administrations, taking over the foreign policy apparatus of the entire Republican Party, and mocking Harrington for befriending feminists and anti-anti-communists. The idea of DSOC was to create a multi-tendency organization uniting the progressive democratic left. DSOC was more old left than new left, wearing its anti-communism proudly. Yet DSOC achieved the communist dream of the popular front periods creating a united front organization, this time without Stalinism. DSOC won the battle against the neocons for influence in the Democratic Party, only to get blown away by the next great turn in U.S. American politics. Harrington sought to ride into power in 1980 when his friend Edward Kennedy tried to unseat Jimmy Carter. Instead, Carter won the Democratic nomination and the neocons rode into power with Ronald Reagan. Many blamed Carter for Reagan's alarming triumph. But Harrington said, Reagan became powerful by offering clear, bad, popular answers to complex problems. <laughs> the left needed new answers calibrated to the new realities of global capitalism. In 1982, DSOC merged with the New Left Organization, the New American Movement, to form Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. There was no mistaking the symbolism of DSA. It was founded to heal the leftover rift between the old left and the new left. DSA debated the fiscal crisis of the state and two academic cottage industries called market socialism and analytical Marxism. I have written a great deal about market socialism, so I don't mean to knock it, but these were sideshows compared to the new forms of socialist theory emphasizing race, gender, and sexual identity as sites of oppression. Not coincidentally, a long departed Italian communist, Antonio Gramsci, won a tremendous vogue for contending that the left wrongly cedes the entire cultural realm to the right. Gramsci died in a fascist prison cell in 1937. He argued that capitalism exercises hegemony over people where they live in schools, civic organizations, religious communities, newspapers, media, the political parties. Hegemony is the cultural process by which a ruling class makes its domination appear natural. Gramsci said the left had to contest cap capitalism at the cultural level, otherwise it was wasting its time. This argument swept much of the socialist left in the 1980s, especially in the academy. 
The academy had never played an important role in the left until socialists from my generation embarked on academic careers. I was a holdout from the surge into the academy. By the time I entered, I was far behind the career curve of my academic friends, and I'm still surprised to be there. But I was able to tell my students, I know Cornell West. <laughs> I have taught Cornell's work every year since then, <clears throat> and the new book has a chapter revolving around Cornell and Nancy Fraser in conversation with Bell Hooks, Michael Lerner, and Iris Marion Young. Cornell described four historic theories of racism. One, racism is an epiphenomenon of the class struggle. Two, workplace or exploitation compounds class exploitation. Three, cultural denigration is a primary site of oppression and liberation. All three of these theories fell short, so Du Bois and Oliver Cox pioneered a fourth school. Racism is a product of class exploitation and of xenophobic attitudes not reducible to it. Here, racism has a life of its own driven by psychological and cultural factors not always related to economic structures. But even Du Bois and Cox operated on the macrostructural level focusing on dynamics of racism within and between social institutions. Cornell said, a full orb theory of racism has to grapple with genealogy, ideology, and micro-institutional factors. Cultural practices of racism are the medium through which selves are produced. In much of Cornell's work, nihilism, is about believing in nothing and despairing of being worthless. A nihilistic culture can kill you if you don't repel its relentless attempts to humiliate and degrade you. But he also stresses that another kind of nihilism is equally devastating. It's the abuse of power that nihilistic elites wage on a daily basis, which falls heaviest on the most vulnerable. Political nihilists are devoted to exercising power and stifling any criticism of their abuse of it. Today, it is more naked than ever. But Cornell has long mourned that no party has a monopoly on it. If your candidate speaks blandly for democracy, evincing no gut-level rage at the injustices of the system, you are voting for a professional nihilist. Five years ago, <clears throat> Bernie Sanders ran the greatest political campaign ever waged by a US American Democratic Socialist, winning 22 primaries and caucuses. He defined democratic socialism as the belief that a living wage, universal health care, a complete education, affordable housing, a clean environment, and a secure retirement are economic rights. Bernie got through the entire 2016 campaign without being asked a single time about worker ownership or public ownership, which was fine with him. <clears throat> <laughs> he was content to fight for things that Social Democrats achieved in Europe a half century ago. But Bernie is far more radical than any Social Democratic leader of the past generation because he renewed the language of the class struggle, a language not spoken in Europe or the USA since the 1940s. His run for president ignited a DSA membership gusher that is still climbing. DSA had 7,000 members when Bernie first ran. Today it has over 100,000 members, including three prominent members of the US Congress. The rush of new members has resurrected ideological battles from 90 years ago and 120 years ago that had no previous standing in DSA. DSA has one caucus that wants a centralized class first organization, ideological discipline, rank and file labor activism, and a guerrilla warfare approach to politics. It has a semi-anarchist focus caucus that opposes all these positions, 
other caucuses that espouse milder forms of these two orientations, and one caucus that stoutly defends DSA's social democratic legacy. <laughs> DSA has long said that its top priorities are social movement activism and public socialist education, whereas electoral politics is important for some and not for others. It can mean different things, and some are outright against it, so it's number three. That has not changed. But the kind of activism that DSA will support in the future is a contested matter, and of course, this whole surge came from the Bernie campaign. This country was founded on colonial devastation, slavery, white supremacy, and the extermination of Native Americans. Socialists cannot retreat to one-factor magical socialism in a nation with this history. At the same time, economic justice is fundamental to all struggles for justice, and only socialists have a record of always having said so. The new democratic socialist movement is not only bigger than the previous one, it's more socialist. <clears throat> for 40 years, most of us in DSOC and DSA were primarily involved in anti-racist or feminist or anti-war or anti-imperialist or ecological or religious activism. Organizationally, democratic socialism was how we conceived the sum of all these things. Cornell often said, I belong to DSA because I need to be in some group that's for everything I'm for. I have long believed that that is the best argument for DSA. <laughs> but now, a gusher of millennial and Generation Z activists identify primarily with DSA. They think socialism is the answer. And they include many of the best organizers in this country. Our country is broken all the way down. And the earth is besieged. We are in the throes of the worst political crisis this country has seen since the Civil War. And we are living in an apocalyptic ecological crisis. There is an imminent danger that a white nationalist movement will seize state power and obliterate what remains of US American democracy. The political imperative of this moment must be to stop this neo-fascist movement from gaining power. Everything we care about at Union stands to be lost if we fail this imperative. I am grateful tonight to be joined by the DSA Religion and Socialism Working Group, which has a table in the back and is an outfit very much like Union in working at the edge of interfaith, intersectional, grassroots activism with a caring spirit. When Paul says that faith, hope, and love remain, these three, he doesn't mean the evidence is in their favor. He means they remain, they abide, regardless of the evidence. Love makes you care, makes you angry, throws you into the struggle. Hope keeps you in the struggle, gives you courage, helps you face another day. Faith is trust and commitment. I need all the faith, hope, and love divine that I can get, and I cannot get any of it on my own. Only through the ties of faith and love with others that grace my life do I have any capacity for hope. Tonight, in the company of beloved friends, I am grateful to all of you. Thank you, friends.
That is our dear brother, Ryan Ho Niebel, professor of social ethics, Gary Dorian. So powerful, so poignant, so prophetic, so true, so good, so beautiful. This is a magnificent event, a historic gathering. And I just want to say in personal terms that he is a great joy in my life. Not simply because he is the preeminent social ethicist grounded in the prophetic tradition, not only because he is the definitive intellectual historian of American democratic socialism, of the social gospel movement, of the black social gospel movement, but he's also a sweet, kind, loving human being. That's a rare thing. It's a very rare combination. And I could imagine he puts a smile on the face of his mother, Virginia, and his father, Jack way out in gut bucket rural bay county near midlands michigan working class to the core and look at him now oh, I'll tell it. oh yes. yes he's been a long distance runner he's been true to his calling that he inculcated his voc his vocation when i first met him it was nearly 40 some years ago, he got his 1978 degree right here at Union. Look at him now. The same humble truth teller, justice seeker, still has the audacity like myself to call himself a Christian, a follower of Jesus of Nazareth in late capitalist modernity. Yes, that is who he is. I know he would want me to point out the fact that we are graced by the presence of one of the grand exemplars of my own tradition. He's the father of unions, distinguished professor of theology, Adria White. His name is Theodore Julius White. Could you just stand, Brother Theodore, please? Could you please just stand, just stand. Yes, we pay tribute. We pay tribute. Grew up in Princeton. Towering artist, operatic singer, friend of Jesse Norman. What is the connection between Theodore Julius White and Gary Dory? They tied the quest for truth and beauty and goodness. And they give of themselves. So when you think of them, think of the American democratic socialist tradition, we first have to acknowledge that even given its marginal status in terms of being a force in shaping the fundamental structures and institutions of a capitalist society, of a deeply white supremacist and homophobic and transphobic society with its ugly forms of anti-Jewish discrimination and anti-Arab and anti-Muslim and anti-Spanish speaking Latinx peoples that the greatest American philosopher, John Dewey, democratic socialist. The greatest poet, Walt Whitman. As a national poet, I prefer Emily Dickinson, but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> Walt Whitman, democratic socialist. The greatest Christian social, social ethicist before Gary Dorian, Ryan Ho Niebuhr in Moral Man and Immoral Society in 1932, a revolutionary text, a defense of, Christian defense of democratic socialists. That was before he made his move into the mainstream that March 15th, 1948 piece by Whitaker Chambers put him on the cover of Time Magazine. Uh-oh, fame is a dangerous thing. David Boyd doesn't have to remind us of that. Helen Keller, 
one of the greatest freedom fighters of the 20th century, class of 1904, Radcliffe, Democratic Socialist. Ella Baker, one of the greatest organizers in the history of the 20th century, Democratic Socialist. We haven't even got to Martin Luther King Jr. yet. First lunch, Coretta Scott King, she told me when I met Martin, the first thing Martin said after a little banter, you probably never met a black Democratic Socialist before you have your baby. Well, he didn't say baby, I just added that. <laughs> Interesting. The same Martin Luther King Jr. who would write an essay, the bravest man I ever met. Who was it? Norman Thomas. When Martin Luther King Jr. received a phone call for the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, don't give it to me, I'm too young. Give it to my hero, Norman Thomas. And we haven't even got to Francis Bellamy yet, the writer of the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag, Democratic Socialist. The writer of America, the beautiful, Catherine Lee Bates, 40 years, Professor at Wellesley in economics, a degree from Oxford. Democratic Socialist. I can go on and on. Leonard Bernstein, my dear brother, Democratic Socialist. Stephen Sondheim might be, I'm gonna ask him one day. <laughs> How could these towering figures, the greatest essayist, son of Harlem, James Baldwin, what do you say? I'm a Yankee Doodle socialist. Okay, we take that. How could these towering figures, Du Bois, the greatest public intellectual in the history of the American empire, democratic socialists, all of these visionary and courageous ones, be democratic socialists, and yet the country itself is so fearful of any democratic socialist vision, analysis, practice, organization, mobilization? It's a crucial question. One we have to wrestle with. Because it raises the question of a Malcolm X. We all love Malcolm. Well, Malcolm would say, well, does America as a civilization lack the structural and intellectual and political capacity to actually allow the masses of its poor and working people to live lives of decency and dignity, given the greed at the top and the indifference in the middle? It's a powerful question. Crucial question. On the ideological front, the political unconscious of so much of the history of this settler colonial experiment is sanctity of private property, the virtue of capital accumulation, period. Period. Beginning with the yeoman farmers, deep entrepreneurial ethic, the barbarism of the slaveholders, still tied to the market, still tied to the global capitalist market, with my own folk picking that cotton. You see, profit maximization. America was a corporation and enterprise before it was a country. Greed, 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 that hound of hell that the great Howard Thurman talked about over and over again. And then it's tied to institutionalized hatred against indigenous peoples and black peoples and brown peoples and Jews and Catholics and others. Gradations and degrees, it's true, the Catholics were not hated with the same degrees the way black people were hated, but let us not forget anti-Catholic hatred. When I was there in Charlottesville, dealing with these vicious gangsters. And I was trying to tell them, you know, Jesus loves you just like he loves me, but you choose to be a gangster and I'm working on mine. And yet you got a Catholic now head of the clan. That's called American upward mobility. You had some Jewish folk now, more and more right wing. I saw some black folk marching in the Charlotte event. You say, what's going on, Corn? This is America. That's how twisted things get, you see. And what Brother Gary's doing in his text is saying if we don't come to terms with the best of our history, and understand who not just Eugene Debs was, but those who were with him, the George Washington Woodbees, the black minister of Mount Zion Baptist Church, who was the greatest black socialist before Du Bois and in the church of the black masses, the Baptist church. We don't come to terms with it. 
we're going to lose everything. So if we can't see class struggle, if you can't see corporate greed, if you can't make the connection between the trade union movement, we got Brother Stanley Ronowitz, who was the greatest organic intellectual of the trade union movement in the last hundred years. Is that right, Brother Jim? We're going to salute him on Friday morning, aren't we? All day. Same tradition. Gary's talking about. And Ronald Wiss was in the text. Oh, I've seen the illusions and the references there. He got 593 pages. Yeah, that's before the footnotes. <laughs> footnotes about 726. So I had to take a real moratorium on my life to read this thing. And it's worth every word, worth every minute. But that ideological front of entrepreneurial activity as a means to which deliverance takes place and the obsession with profit maximization, the prioritizing of it, given whatever costs, fossil fuel, give up the planet. Wall Street greed, Silicon Valley greed, give up community, give up decent housing for ordinary people. Profit maximization at any cost. And it's colorful. Bring in the diversity, bring in the equity, bring in the inclusion, and help us exploit others and feel good about it. Because we now we got some black folk doing it. Now we got black presidents who can conform to drones on innocent people, conform to Wall Street greed, conform to a surveillance state, conform to a national security state, because it's colorful. How empty, how shallow. Read my brother's book. He's laying it out. Sister Serene understands this so very well, given her own visionary and courageous leadership against, against overwhelming odds. But on the political front, let us be clear that it had much to do with the gift of the vote to the masses of white working class men in the 1830s. Nearly every modern society had a class-based labor party in order to gain the right to vote. That didn't happen in the United States. So there was no class consciousness having to do with voting. The class consciousness had to do with either the workplace or creating cultures that would allow folk to shift from ethnic and racial and gender preoccupations to including class consciousness. This is very important. And then America has the most multi-ethnic, multi-racial, heterogeneous working class in the history of the world in the 19th and 20th century. So you got intra-class struggles, and you got struggles against the white collar and the blue collar, all of those internal conflicts that make it difficult for a socialist identity to flow from a class identity. So even though class struggle was real, how does that class struggle result in a class unity? And hence the easy divine and conquer strategies of the ruling class, of the power elites. But one other crucial point makes it clear the vast repression of the U.S. nation state against any major socialist movement that brings people together of all colors and genders and sexual orientations. Dear Sister Rita, we're so glad to have you here. You're such a loyal citizen of a Union Theological Seminary. But understanding the role of the legal system, Robeson, house arrest, Du Bois, house arrest, Martin King, killed, Mumia Abu Jamal, incarcerated, Black Panther Party, repressed, FBI, infiltrate, spies everywhere. We probably got some FBI now. How you doing? Yeah, we here at Union trying to tell the truth just like we did in 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We gonna continue to do it. You say, oh, Brother West, you being facetious. No, not at all. Anybody who falls in love with poor and working people in the American empire is subject to criminal, being criminalized and incarcerated. It's a fundamental fact. It was one of the crucial realities in the 1960s and 70s when they found out the FBI, when they found out that the prison industrial complex waiting for them, but trumped up charges. So the question becomes, are you, 
strong enough to keep your spirit intact, to be a long distance runner like Brother Gary. He's not just some abstract academic concern, but professional managerial activities that generate skills for some set of young people to go out into the world and conform to injustice. He's been a participant as well as an intellectual analyst and observer. That's why the story's so rich. He's got inside and outside. We all need critical distance, but he's a participant too. That's why he brought the, the DSA folk with him. Because this di dialogue itself is part and parcel of an attempt to get us to see more clearly and feel more deeply and act more courageously so that theory and praxis become not simply part of our rhetoric, but rather is enacted in our lives, given the fallible and finite and fallen quality of each and every one of us. That's what makes this book so crucial and so powerful. And if we don't respond to the challenge of his text, lose the planet, lose what's left of American democratic experience. But even worse, more than that, we lose the best of the spirit of the species is integrity and honesty and decency and generosity and treating people sweetly and kindly and trying to translate that structurally and institutionally into re regulations that can impose some accountability of greedy corporate elites that would do anything for profit maximizing. This text ends with five magnificent words. It's a kind of love letter to the younger generation. Five words are to outrage, to melt away. I think that's what he says. And this, he said, we got a new generation now. They are too outraged to melt away. They're not going to be spineless. They're not going to be conformist. They're not going to be complacent. They're not going to be complicitous. And they're not going to be cowardly. They're going to fight intellectually, spiritually, morally, with the memory of those who came before, building on their insights and witness, but also bringing their own voices to bear, not just in the US context, not just in the Western Hemispheric context, but in the global context, connecting with our Dalit brothers and sisters in India, connecting with the landless peasants in Brazil, connecting with workers in Panama, connecting with the feminist movements in Germany, connecting with what's going on right now in Ethiopia, making sure that the dignity of everyday peoples in every corner of the African continent can be affirmed against Africa, against Chinese colonial invasion and American colonial invasion in Africa, connections with what's happening in Vietnam. That's the global vision given the local activism that sits at the center, the decentering and the democratic forms of control at the workplace that our dear brother Rick Wolf reminds us over and over again. That's why I'm on fire about this book. And that's why my love for this brother that is inseparable from that fire allows me to be even as an old school brother Somebody committed to the same fight that he is until the worms get our body. I just said, I don't know if I can get up and say anything more. Um, wow. Um, first of all, for those of you who haven't seen it, reading this book has over the last month increased my upper body strength. <laughs> <laughs> It's magnificent. Uh, it is also classic Gary Dorian. It shows the work of an encyclopedic mind 
that as it takes the stories of history has this remarkable capacity to map them in relation to one another. Uh, he, he's a map maker. Uh, and in the process of mapping history that he's pulling from every direction, he also has the ability to find the threads that take an ordinary looking map and turn it into a story where you can see what might appear to be disparate parts as interconnected to one another. And that is the power of this story, which in all of its different twists and turns is, is a single story. Um, it is the story of, um, just occurred to me today in terms of thinking about this story, it is a story of American democratic socialism, but it is also a story in a sense that starts and ends with DSA. It is an account of DSA today and a genealogy of how it became what it is. It starts in the present and tells a story that works backwards towards its origin. And you would tell a very different story about the, even the same group of people if you started in a different starting point. But he's starting in this moment in time with the question of democratic American socialism, and he's asking the question of how it is we got here. I have to say one of the most beautiful things about this book is the stories in it. I love the stories of Scudder, Heron, O'Hare, Debs, Woodby, the Brotherhood of Porters, and the way in which, and this is the beauty of, of American democratic socialism, uh, Gary manages to bring the political, the analytic and social together with the personal, the quirks and, of the personalities and the home lives and the limits and the very humanness of a movement as it develops and twists and turns and fractures and comes back together in new forms, ever resistant and yet ever fragile. It's going to become a classic, a textbook that many will read, but most importantly, it's a story changer. Because what it happens in this book is in addition to telling the story of American democratic socialism, Gary tells the story of the Christian thread that runs through it. That is a huge part of the story, as he says at the beginning of the book and says throughout, that never gets spoken. And it's a really interesting question for us, I think, to come back to is to say, why did that happen? Why did that happen? Um, and in and out through the book, you see uh, the importance of that Christian thread, um, but it's still perplexing as to why at some points it, the thread loses its line and gets cut. I'm also, after reading this book, eager to, I, as I was reading it, I had many thoughts of many other books that Gary should be writing, but it would be a very, a very interesting book to uh, come back and look at an institution like Union Theological Seminary and see how a single place over a period of 182 years of commitment to these very ideals has an influence um, in the shaping of this relationship between socialism, Christianity, and America. Um, so Gary, you can get working on that one soon, okay? Um, so I want to, uh, in my comments, uh, ask a few questions. Uh, that I had as I sorted through uh, these many brilliant pages. So as I said, it's a, it's a genealogy of DSA that has as its guardrails um, the present DSA and how it got here and the question of the role of religion in its formation. And as the book moves forward and throughout it, Gary pays attention time and again to race and gender, mainly through the characters in the story that, whose lives he lifts up and whose words he puts onto the page. It's not until the end of the book that we begin to hear, particularly the voices around gender and race, actually speak about an analytic approach to what constitutes the heart and the commitments of socialism. And we have a very complex dis discussion that Gary lays out between uh, Bell Hooks, Nancy Frazier, Iris Miriam Young, Judith Butler, not just about the construction of gender and race, but about the very understanding we have of socialism and how we understand labor and what capitalism is. 
It sort of dives into the heart of the analysis itself. But I find it interesting, and this is another question for us to discuss in terms of race, that that same complex analysis when it comes to the legacy of white supremacy and the history of chattel slavery in DSA, um, in an understanding of socialism, isn't lifted up in the same way. It's lifted up through the voices, but not through that sort of analytic moment when it pierces to the heart of what you're talking about when you're talking about socialism. And why is it that it's so hard to get race into that space? I mean, gender just seems to like, you know, division of labor, history of that, but it's like the race keeps bumping up against it, but not breaking into the very heart of what it is itself. So I want to come back and talk about that. I want to know from Gary and Cornell both why it took Gramsci so long to get to the United States. <laughs> he dies in a prison, and as Gary said, in um, 1937, and he only appears in Gary's book beginning with the work of Cornell West. Now, he did have a longer legacy uh, through the Birmingham School, uh, Stuart Hall, uh, in a British context, but what is it that made the U.S. in terms of socialism so resistant to that cultural moment when other places weren't? What is it about this place that the cultural moment was so peculiarly threatening? Um, so it, it, it's sort of like race in that regard. What is it that makes that resistance there? Um, I also want to know, um, in terms of the analysis, I couldn't help, as uh, both Cornell and Gary repeatedly return to, the present moment. Um, there are times when you trace this history and you can see how close, in terms of its twist and turns, the history of democratic socialism comes, um, borders on a real questioning of the reality of democracy itself. Um, it, it, it creeps up to the edge at times of fascism. Um, it calls into question that sometimes um, the reality of populism. And I think in this particular moment, it bids us ask serious questions about where we are politically and why is it that a far right religious movement seems to have captured the hearts of so many working people. Um, and, and why that socialist vision can't seem to, and it's a long history of it, get purchased, particularly in agrarian spaces with respect to that set of, of commitments. And we're in the middle of that right now. Um, so uh, two more questions I wanted to ask. One is when it comes to tracing the legacy of Christianity in American democratic socialism, I kept wondering as well, if there is a legacy there that's not only found in the voices of the individual Christian informed leaders, but is it embedded in the very narrative itself of what constitutes American democratic socialism? Is there something about it coming out of these Christian roots that looks distinctly Christian when it's not being Christian at all? And how do we talk about that kind of connection that's in the very narrative structure of how it moves and, and, and is shaped? Um, can't uh, help but ask um, the last question here. Well, there's really uh, two questions I have. One is I'm just curious about um, who would be our, because they're always there in the history as Gary is unfolding it. Uh, there's always within American democratic socialism as there is within socialism in Europe, the trots. Who are the trots of the moment? Uh, very interesting question to consider. And then last, um, just in terms of the pertinence of this book, AOC is right here up to the very last page, but Gary finished this book before last week. Um, so once more, you see these tensions and democratic socialism in the American context playing itself out with the very heated discussions about AOC's decision not to support in the Democratic Party Biden's infrastructure plan. Right there, right there, you see the very struggles that fill the pages of this book and raises the question of what does it mean in this context to respond to and think about the relationship between coalition and strategy and uh, 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 the purity of Eugene Debs. 
Um, so with those questions, I'm going to uh, turn it back over to uh, Cornell and Gary to figure all those out for us because they have, these two have actually thought more about these questions than probably any two other people in the United States today. So. Well, that was tremendous. Yes. Um. Try this one. Ooh, see, oh, see, you got to have this one, brother. One. Yeah. Why? There you go. Yes, well, you're going to get it very soon. But. <laughs> so I think there are six questions here. <clears throat> Each one, of course, uh, is thick. Uh, and rounded, and it's got layers to it. And, um, and I, I've had this experience before with Serene of uh, describing uh, what I've done in a book in a way that helped me understand it uh, better than I did uh, when I wrote it. That's just that sort of analytical way of sort of seeing throughputs and how arguments were came together. Um, and at least see the, what, what the attempt was um, to, to pull something off. So I think I'm going to, I'll just start at the top. And uh, if you want to look at my notes here, Cornell, just to remind yourself what, the, what these questions were, uh, we, we might just start down this list. Um, the first one had to do with the question about the Christian socialism that's in the book, that it's a thread that's in it, but you also mention, and I think rightly, um, that, that it's a thread that, that breaks uh, near the end. Um, not so much there, far more before, uh, you know, why about that and just all of what's in that um, and then going uh, to how uh, uh, indeed uh, there, there's a, there's something that just never really gets settled with anywhere in this narrative where you, even after you've done a critical race theory turn and you have people like Michael Eric Dyson and Cornell and all our friends who just joined DSA, uh, still didn't really make DSA a different kind of outfit. Uh, they were, that, uh, that, the, that the platform statements we put out there still sound additive. It still sounds like add and stir uh, and hasn't really actually been changed um, by, by really the cultural interventions of that same generation. It's hard to even see in the, in the literature or just how the organization presents itself or in fact what it is. Uh, so those are your first two questions, and we, we might have to sit here for a while with that. And then there's also this wonderful question about why so late to Gramsci, which by the time we get there, we may have already you know, made, said some things about that, but let, let's try that, okay? All right. um, <laughs> well, firstly, with regard to this religious socialist um, question, I think the first thing just to say about this is that, you know, excluding the religious people is just, is just the normal thing in continental socialism. Um, so that's what that's just what's normal um, and of course a lot of that then got imported to this country because that's you know That's where a lot of it came from uh, So th so the way that religion gets talked about which is hardly at all except you know in a kind of denigrating way It's, it's something we've outgrown or overcome um, or it's 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 ideology or at least bad ideology or like all of those things from the past um, that are just standard fare um, in, in continental social democracy, well, you know, that, that's just the usual thing uh, for so many people in this story um, anyway. Now, England is a different deal. Uh, the, uh, religious socialism, Christian socialism has always operated very differently in England, has been able to uh, operate differently, is, is, is in the tent. Um, is never made to feel like, what are you people doing here? Uh, or you need to over, you know, you need to throw out your religion in order to become socialist or all that stuff um, that continental Christian socialists have to deal with uh, in their national contracts virtually everywhere um, was, was never the case um, in England. Um, and so there is, and so, and so therefore the richest tradition of Christian socialism is the English one. Uh, I mean, there it just, it formed powerful organizations. It was powerfully formative and in getting into what became the Labor Party. Um, it's just been part of the furniture, part of the structure ever since. Even people who aren't Christian socialists in England, you can hear it in them. 
um, because you know they they picked it up from from you know the, all all these great people uh, in their in their own tradition who are ha with uh, without dispute are part of the tradition of British socialism. Just no dispute about it. I mean, R. H. Tawney is the greatest um, so British socialist of the 20th century period, uh, and very deeply a Christian socialist. No one ever tries to write him out for being Christian, um, whereas in Europe, that's a, that's a battlement thing. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, secondly, yeah, the U.S. story is more like the British one, um, in that you've got a, you've got a continuation of a Puritan story. You've got, you've got, uh, abolitionist movements just, you know, just reading themselves forward. Now, you know, different kinds of abolitionism, both white social gospel and black social gospel, all of that. Uh, if you just start you start to wash through the 19th century, get into the 1860s and 70s, and you see some of the very same people who, in the, and sometimes they're the very same people who in times past were calling themselves radical Democrats or something like that. Now they're calling themselves socialists because they've come to see that, yeah, socialism is actually the best name for all the things I'm for. Everything that I care about is actually here. And indeed, my Christianity or my religious something is constitutive. Um, to what that is. And so the U.S. American story is more like um, the British story than like what was the case um, in the continent, except, of course, a fair amount of this continental story did end up here uh, anyway. So someone like, you know, the greatest of the radical social gospelers of the turn of the 20th century, Walter Rauschenbusch, never joined the Socialist Party. Um, he just thought, you know, those people, they're, they're kind of mean. They're, they're, they, they're mean toward religion. I'm going to get my feelings hurt. Uh, no, he just, he just couldn't bear that. It was hard enough for him to get beaten up by conservative Baptists all the time. So, you know, he just, he just wrote that. Vita Scudder's always, you know, begging him, please join the party. It would do so much uh, for the movement if you joined. Um, and he, you know, he just puts her off. Um, and so there, you know, that's the complicated thing about who came, who joined and who didn't. The fact is an awful lot of them did join and had, had an importance, had an important role in early American democratic socialism that has in fact not been told. And this is part two here. Uh, yes, they're, they're not in the books. Uh, I, you know, I reread all the books before I started writing this one. Um, and it just reminded me all the more about, yeah, wow, Daniel Bell says like three sentences. Uh, on what I think is an important subject and go right down the row and you know that that they're all like that um, Whoever these Christian socialists were well, they couldn't be they can't be important because they're Christians. They're just preachers, right? Well, one of the things that does is that actually those those Christian socialist ministers of that first generation They're speaking to middle-class audiences that nobody else in my picture has access to uh, That alone is significant for what for its reach um, and um, and all those histories just don't get that at all because in fact, indeed, they've sort of inherited this, this, this socialist prejudice that does come from various places that just says these religious people, even if we have a bunch of them, well, we, we're a little embarrassed about it or we need to tolerate them or certainly they can't be important. Uh, and maybe they can help out in their little, you know, their church sphere, um, but they're not really interested in them otherwise. And, then, and so therefore so much is lost including so many African-Americans and women who came in, because about 90% of the women in the early Socialist Party, they all came in through the temperance movement, temperance and you know suffrage from the Willard organization, where women are used to being in their own organization, because that, you know, that's how they cut their teeth in activism, is through, is through the temperance union, and now they join the Socialist Party, and they're gonna have a women's organization. Um, you, you lose so much of that if you just, you're just not even interested in religion. And the same thing uh, with, with African-American so, uh, Christian socialists. I mean, would-be is just, just the greatest, uh, but there are plenty of others. Uh, George Slater and, and Robert Bagnall and just the list goes on. Um, that's all lost if you just, if you just screen this out. Um, but in fact, um, yeah, it almost happened again. I had, I had to fight with, a, with two peer reviewers um, who didn't want, you know, wanted less of this religious thing because, you know, they, they weren't, that, that's not their story at all. This is just not how, this is not what's important. All these religious people, too many religious people. I know you're one of them, but still, you know, can't, can't, you, can't you tamp that down? And then the second thing, which is going to be several questions down, had to do with this theory business, because that, when I go, when I go long for theory in that next, last chapter, because the academics have now entered, uh, they were trying to get me to cut that down as well because 
You know, that's not organizing. That's not the normal stuff, right? Now I'm, now there's some kind of intervention of an analytical sort is being asked for that they maybe could recite what Cornell's socialist theory of racism was, but they never actually took it seriously. The, the idea that you would actually, you let that be the lens by which you understand all this and understand how we got the way we are is just not really ever on the table. And so then what happens, and now I realize I have skipped to something for, by like question number five, but um, when, you, when you live through this as long as I have, you see that even after an intervention like Cornell's essay was made, Socialist Theory of Racism, it's been canonical ever since, DSA has published it for years, it's always on the table, you can get it, um, and yet nothing, no gain of this sort is ever settled. It's not like, okay, we've made a breakthrough. We now see it. We see it in an intersectional way that we didn't before. No, it's, you know, the next thing comes out and you see it's it's still just ahead and stir. Um, we haven't really made the breakthrough, partly because, you know, you still get the next generation come in and they, no, they, they, now they need to experience all this and live it. Um, and right now, we have bruising arguments going on in DSA right now over this very thing. Um, and what, how it's going to come out, what kind of an organization we're going to be coming through it um, remains to be seen. Well, I'll tell you, I wish we had about two and a half hours tonight because these issues are so important. I was so glad you mentioned the great R.H. Tawney because people need to reread his book, The Acquisitive Society. It's pertinent, 100 years later, equality. Those two powerful texts that he inspired. America's greatest literary critic, middle part of the 20th century, his name was F. O. Matheson, Francis Otto Matheson. His great book in 1941, American Renaissance, was on Dickinson and Whitman and so forth. He was master of Elliott House at Harvard. He jumped off the top of the major hotel in Boston, committed suicide, wrestling with his gay identity as a Christian socialist, given his marginality. So if R.H. Tom. Testing, testing. Now, what's interesting about Matheson is he gives the money he receives from his father, the $5,000 that becomes the, the, the foundation for the monthly review, which is the longest independent Marxist journal in the history of America, founded by Paul Sweezy and Paul Baron. It was 1984 for the first time that journal had a discussion between Marxism and religion. That they, they were kind enough to ask me to edit, which I did, because he's about close partners. I think the battery is, see Gary's, oh, so Gary's fire. Uh, okay. Is it yours? Your fire just sucked all of the juice up. This is working here. Absolutely. Now, why is this important? Well, one is that Gramsci comes to America in 1971 because that's the first time the Italian is translated into English. And given the intellectual parochialism of the corporate publishers and of much of the intelligentsia, you don't have the openness of a global discourse. They could have read Jose Maria Tiki in Peru, who was already using Gramsci way back decades before. They weren't reading Spanish, you see? So that, so that intellectually and theoretically, and, and, and Brother Jan can lay this out better than anybody else right here at Union. Thank God we got Brother Jan here because his, the, the crucial teaching and, and students know what I'm talking about. He's sitting right there. Just ra raise your hand, brother. Ra there he is. Give it up. Give it up for that brother. He keeps this tradition alive. You see, don't, don't even get to Frankfurt School till the 70s. They publish it in the 30s and 40s. The translations are late. But not only that, but the great Stanley Aronowitz in his last book on C. Wright Mill. C. Wright Mills taught across the street at Columbia as one of the greatest leftist sociologists, and he had a theory of the cultural apparatus. 
And if the left doesn't come to terms with the relation of the cultural apparatus to class struggle, it will never appeal to everyday people. And Harold Cruz in The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual, 1967, uses C. Wright Mills' text over and over and over again within the black context of theater and music and the essay on Lorraine Hansberry and Paul Robeson and so forth. So we had some discussions of culture in relation to politics, even before Gramsci made his way over with the translation. Uh, uh, but it was so fragmented. Cruz's book is still one of the best books ever written, even though I think he's wrong about a lot of things. You can't talk about the black intelligentsia without talking about Harold Cruz, which means you can't talk about it without talking about C. Wright Mills and the cultural apparatus. And when the feminist and the womanist interventions take place, then you got it on a higher level. And same is true with these with the rich anti-homophobic and anti-transphobic discussions. Uh, uh, but empire must still be central. And that's what you, that's what's usually pushed to the side. We see, and the, the moments of William Appleton Williams, America as empire as a way of life. That's William Appleton Williams way back forty five years ago, hardly even known, lost, lost, and yet today that text is as relevant as ever, given the the framework that he has. You see, well, that's just. I can is that working all right? Yeah. Oh, no, I think you covered them, brother. Yeah, no, I can't add to that. that absolutely. Is this, is this on now? OK, yeah, yeah. how is it? OK. Um, well, since if we're doing the Gramsci question, uh, I think I will add a couple more things. I do think the translation question is just, just enormously important. If Gramsci had written in German, uh, n not as much of a problem, right? Uh, you have academics of, of that generation. Uh, who, who, who could have? Uh, in Britain, yeah. with Stuart Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we said a word about that. Yeah. Got yeah. That's true. Um, I don't know as much about sort of the English. You know, I'd I would have to think about that um, for a moment. I don't want to just run to something, but yeah. Do more British intellectuals read Italian than, than, than U.S. Americans of that generation? Probably, probably, uh, and just enough um, that it could have entered sort of the bloodstream. I mean, goodness, you know, Immanuel Kant only got to England through one person, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, you know, but then that's, that's all it took. <clears throat> um, but besides from that, the, the translation issue, uh, it's, you know, Gramsci is making a critique of Marxism. I mean, there's a barrier there. Uh, if you're, even if you've already, even if you've given up magical one-factor Marx, you know, Marxism, nonetheless, it's a fundamental enough critique of it about why it doesn't work or why it isn't enough. That that I think just that's a barrier. Uh, now, certainly, it helps. He's he's at that very time writing in the nineteen in the twenties and early thirties. Uh, though in prison, uh, when the Frankfurt School is starting up. So you do have a, a group of folks, Lukash and others, who are asking the, the similar kinds of questions, uh, you know, that, that are, you know, critical uh, of Marxism. But I just, I think that uh, because he's out of circulation, because it's the wrong language, because it's a certain kind of barrier that just going so hard for the cultural question that just isn't how Marxists have ever talked. Uh, before, I just think that we shouldn't, uh, you know, minimize what a barrier um, that was. And certainly that was the true for these American socialists of the 40s and 50s. They weren't reading Gramsci. Um, that's just not what, what that's not what, re what is received uh, to them. And they still have pretty much a catechism kind of Marxism, except for an argument that they've, they've got to explain what happened in the Soviet Union and then everything gets marked. Um, by which side are you on in, you know, Stalin versus Trotsky, um, and even Trotsky's zig and zag, uh, that becomes so defining for them uh, that then that's just, that's just carrying the whole train uh, for them. And then, you know, and, and then they've got more iterations even after that um, dur during this time. So that's what's going on in, within, you know, what's called American Marxism. Um, and it's, it's highly, I mean, it's intellectual. Irving Kristol said, Grow, being in a being in a Trotskyite cell, I got a far more rigorous education than I could have gotten in any graduate school in in, in, in the United States, 
And that's after, you know, Irving Kristol became a neo-con. He's willing to say that, yeah, it's, it's in Trotskyism that I got my, I got my, my, my critical acumen, my sort of capacities. Um, so there's all that. Um, I just think also, yes, you need, then you need the advocates. You need those critical people uh, who, could, who could press, who could push. Um, and uh, yes, Gramsci's now getting translated in the early 1970s. Finally, it's available. And um, the people, I want to just give a shout out to them. This is, this is NAM. This is part of the, the great sort of legacy of the new American movement. They didn't last for very long. They were never a very big outfit. Um, but they pressed hard. Uh, they pushed. They had these Gramsci schools. Richard Healy uh, and, uh, and Stanley. Stanley, you know, started the first one. Um, and others uh, who, who, go was, ahead. Uh, was Pete Buttigieg's father. He was another one, yes. My dear brother Joseph Buttigieg, he and I would fly to Italy every year. He was the founder of the International Gramsci Society. Now, you, his son didn't follow through on what. <laughs> I mean, you know, I love Pete, but he's just too centrist and neoliberal. For, but, the, uh, but, but Joseph Buttigieg, who's a towering figure from Malta, he, he translated all of Gramsci. He was a dean of humanities at, uh, at Notre Dame. Uh, uh, so that in that sense, that, that concern about, but, but what also happens to Gramsci is he gets demarxianized. I remember I sat in on a course by the great Edward Zaid, who talked about Gramsci for three weeks. And Edward was one of the towering figures. He's a towering intellectual. But you would never know Gramsci was a communist because he talked about hegemony. He talked about superstructure. He talked about culture. And so you would never know he was head of the Communist Party in a fascist prison, class analysis, critique of empire. Gramsci becomes part of cultural studies more and more and more. And then when Foucault comes in, you get this French occupation of the American leftist mind, which is not a positive thing. <clears throat> because it flattens out class, it flattens out empire, and it's just structures of feeling, it's just structures of, of value and so forth. You get the cultural theorists, no real grounding in class analysis in that way. So Gramsci can take in a number of different directions. Um, so I made the point about NAM that, that that's part of its, its legacy during its short existence as it pushed so hard and had the Gramsci in schools um, and got literature out there and people like Stanley Aronowitz and Healy and others uh, sort of made their careers, you know, um, you know uh, pressing this line of argument. The other thing I want to say about NAM, because uh, it'd just be wrong to say anything at all and then not say this, is that they were socialist feminist, every one of them. They, they were on the line for it. Uh, it was just a given from the outset. We are not going to have a pluralism of views about feminism in this socialist organization. It was in its own identity. Getting to that analytical point that Serene was pressing, Otherwise, NAM was that kind of an organization that said we're going to be a different kind of a place because we're feminist. Now, you know, it doesn't mean that there aren't there isn't room for different kinds of feminism in here, as, as, there, as there was, as there were in that in that case. Um, but the 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 theoretical and just day to day sort of lived quality of of sort of asking the question, what is it? What how is this a different kind of socialist organization because it's feminist? was real um, in NAM. Um, and DSOC, not so much. Uh, but, you know, then, then they brought that into the DSA. We've well, got one other issue, too, which is, of course, the Middle East and the complicated Israel, uh, issue of Israel. Because you remember, that was the one issue. And you make that point in the text, though, don't you? Yeah. The DSOC and NAM, when they came together, we had this intense knock them out, drag them out. I tried to have some injection of the Holy Ghost, but it just wouldn't come. It was intense. And, and the agreement was, well, we'll make, you should just tell us what the agreement is right on the page. You've got it right there on the page. I forget what page number. That the agreement was there would be support of direct uh, military, support of the military in Israel, on the one hand, as long as there was what was it? What was it? What was the payback? Uh, it was a balanced thing. It was a. Uh, um, well, that was it. I mean, there was. I mean, that was the only, that issue was the only one that had to be negotiated, and something was promised. 
Uh, and, but so then it was there was like, some acknowledgement of Palestinian. Yeah. Some, How it was weak as pre sweet and Kool Aid, but still it was. It, it, it was some well, acknowledgement of the Palestinian Well, sure. No, but, this, but, this, like but that, that was standard it? issue. I mean, that's you know. two, two state solution with borders approximately along the green line, right? That ev anything we would put out is going to say that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and which they did. I mean, they were always sort of true to that, but of course, that's all it was. But, but that's that, yes, the Tro that's the Trojan horse for saying we, we, we won't be against this. And the thing about that is that is this, this was mostly an issue of one whole side of DSOC who just doesn't trust anybody who doesn't have their pedigree, their background, their sort of existential relation to Israel, um, who don't, you know, they just don't want to be in an organization where people where they feel like that is now going to be embattled, where they can't trust um, that they're, they're among people who, you know, to whom they trust. And because it was so, so emotional, um, it, it produced the one just truly ugly DSOC conference, you know, I ever saw. Um, because, yeah, they were trying to stop the merger all over this, even though it was clear that they were going to win on the one, the one thing that you can say, okay, what are we talking about here? Other than just we're uncomfortable with people who aren't like ourselves. Uh, what, other, what otherwise are we actually talking about? Well, it was just that military aid issue, and and Nam Nam, you know, was willing to sign on for that. Um, still, it was yeah, it was very very difficult. Um, yes. Wow. Well. Time to open it up to student questions. Um, again, if you have questions, um, either on Zoom, you can put those in the chat. Our friends there, and if you're in. Uh, inside the room, please text your questions to 646-397-6144. And uh, we have some questions already. Um, so I'll start with the first student question. Uh, what does a truly democratic economic theory look like? Um, do any American socialists resemble, in theory and praxis, the thought of the famous socialist Rosa Luxemburg? <laughs> well, um, there is a suggestion of true belief in this question, right? Uh, that there's, there's some real thing, um, and then anything that kind of falls by the wayside of it or isn't quite what that was, is is not real right is not truly marxist or so on and the like and and then we get it um we get the benchmark sort of example of it it's it's rosa right mm. um she's the one who defines what uh, what the real thing uh would be uh of course rosa luxembourg is just one of the fabulous figures uh, of this whole tradition just just awesomely brave almost unfathomably brilliant um, a, a, a fabulous writer, a person of just immense sort of a passion. You just pick up anything she ever wrote about anything, uh, and you're hooked. I mean, you just can't put it down. Uh, so she's galvanizing. She walked into the SPD, uh, and and they were, you know, they had to deal with her from the moment uh, that she came. And, she, and right away, she's in a fundamental argument uh, with Edward Bernstein. And so you have out the whole true Marxism versus what came to be called revisionism uh, right there uh, with Rosa. Um, this, of course, is not my orientation to say, oh, there's just one, there's one true thing. There's one true, well, there's only one way to read Marx or only one way to apply Marx. I don't think that kind of, that way of thinking even applies terribly well to Marx himself. Marx, and it was to his dying days, you know, trying to, did I get it right? Uh, volume three of Capital isn't 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 altogether like you know what came before. He's continuing to to um, to work on it to refine the theory. Just for example, even just with regard to marginal uh, utility uh, to economics, uh, Volume three's got different kinds of arguments going on uh, than what you could get out of Volume one. So I think Marx is more Marx himself is much more empirical than that. And of course, as he famously said, I you know I apparently I am not a Marxist because. Uh, he, he's, he's already familiar with a certain kind of dogmatic Marxism that just needs to have it be just like this and then just you always apply it in a certain way. So I, to me, there's, this is a, this is, these, are, these are family arguments. 
mm -hmm. uh, that you have. I have enormous respect for Edward Bernstein, and I think he got certain things just terribly wrong. Um, and certainly I have enormous respect for Karl Kotsky as well. Um, and that's, you know, that's the two loggerheads. That's the, that's the debate within the SPD of that generation. So, and so they can apply the same, the same sort of analysis to this book. This book's chock full of, you know, arguments of that sort. Michael Harrington, just, just the zig and zag of Harrington. Uh, him dealing with stagflation, uh, rethinking Marxism, trying to apply Marx to the, to the USA of 1980. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mike has to go through all manner of mental gymnastics, to, and, and, and indeed, all, every step of the way, people are still saying, is this still Marxism, right? Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of people in the room would say, no, it isn't, you've just departed too far. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think these are legitimate debates. Uh, this is just mm -hmm. what, what, what it is. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important, just very briefly, to, to make a crucial distinction, though, between somebody like Rosa Parks, Ro I mean, Rosa Luxemburg, because there's only one Rosa Luxemburg. Because she manages to be a revolutionary mm. without the need for this vanguard party of professional revolutionaries who are dictating the everyday working people. Mm -hmm. She's a council communist, as was Stanley Aronowitz. That's my own ideological source within the Marxist tradition. Soviets without Bolsheviks. That was Kronstadt. Councils without professional revolutionaries dictating to them. So you have to have democratic organization in your movement that prefigures what your society is going to look like. You don't have vanguard elitists who are imposing themselves and then end up reproducing elite structures of domination after the revolution. So Rosa Luxemburg was a council communist in a way in which Gorder and Panikok and early Karl Korsh, Korsh were. And that's democracy all the way down, it was a suspicion of the Leninist, the Trotskyites, and so forth. Whereas the, burst, the followers of Bernstein were really reformists. You know, they're not revolutionaries at all, really. They're, they're decent, you know, courageous reformers, but they really are reformers. Is, is that a fair, is that too harsh though, brother? Oh no, that's not too harsh. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> no, no. we telling the truth, we telling the truth. All right. Okay, yeah. all right, yes, but um, I, I agree with all that. Um, but we don't have any examples of councilism getting very far anywhere, whereas movements that can read Bernstein and say, yeah, I recognize that. That's, that's sort of like what's going on in my industrial union right now. Mm -hmm. um, there, there you're making connection uh, with really existing uh, industrial union, even sometimes trade union uh, movements, and certainly social democratic parties um, as well. And so when I go first for, you know, we got to be able to work together, of course, that's my first impulse. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, you come along right away and say, yeah, but wait a minute, there's something to talk about here. Yes. Um, there is a kind of councilist ideal. If we want to talk about what it would be if we, you know, could just, it just seems like the, 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 the purest, the, the, the most, the ideal sort of form of kind of radical democracy, what would it be like? We would agree about that. Um, and there, you know, it's, it's even called different things um, in different contexts. In, in the British context, you had a whole run of something called, called guild socialism that for a while, was speaking to this subject in, that I made, right? They were really getting somewhere. Uh, and then the bottom fell out of the, the English economy in 1923 and the Labour Party cut them off. Um, and no, we, we don't have guild socialism anymore. But that, there was an example of this idea actually scaling up beyond just the ranks of a you know, little group. When did you actually, this is not an argument that either one of you made, but wouldn't you? find it to in um, very low church Christian socialists who in their church life actually function according to a kind of council. Hmm. I mean, that's the way they, that's the way they're socially organized. Um, you know, minister has no privilege except maybe a little bit of education, but I've got a couple of people here kind of giving me a look right now because they're in the black social gospel course. And uh, it, it took us several weeks to finally get to the Baptists. And the reason it takes several weeks to get to the Baptists, it took them till 1895 to finally have a denomination. And the reason why is 
they're, they're against this, right? They're, they're, they're Baptists for a reason. Uh, and so, but they want to have an impact, so these things don't go together, right? They want to have an impact, but they're Baptists, so they just keep splitting, and they never scale up to anything. Uh, but finally, we did get there, didn't we? Uh, where that, now there's an NBC, and we're going to see what comes of that, because that's where Martin Luther King and all these people came from. Mm -hmm. uh, is that story? Yeah, I think it's, that's right. We got the Quakers and the Mennonites, who we love so dearly. Uh, uh, they've got their own autonomous communities. Some people call them utopian communities and so forth, but they're trying to engage in self-organization, self-governance in that way. Suspicious of any elite, mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. structures of domination that wouldn't allow the voices from below. That's very true. Well, I'm going to allow some more voices here. Um, so the next couple of questions, um, and then I'll, I'm going to ask like two or three questions, and if you could answer those, um, because we are I'm coming to the close of the hour. Um, what arguments do we make against incrementalists who forestall our pro who forestall our progress to um, to too great a degree? And then that's one. So kind of hold on to that. Um, ah. Uh, here's another. I keep Trump close by on IG and signed up for his emails. He seems determined to continue to be divisive. Worst case scenario. Uh, what if he is elected president? What advice do you have in how to be strong and fight for the people? I, I want to do one more that comes from Zoom. Um, this is from Bob. Uh, isn't democratic socialism what we read in Matthew 5 through 25? especially in chapter 25 when Jesus's disciples asked when he was hungry and they did not feed him and Jesus answered when you don't do it to the least of my brothers you did it to me right and I think uh, when you what, let me just read it again so I have it clear uh, when you didn't do to the least of my brothers you did it to me so do you want to just any order <laughs> but take any of those three well, the first one was incrementalism, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I am not the kind of democratic socialist who looks down on social democracy or needs to sort of put that in its place, uh, because I, I, have, I have enormous respect for the achievements of social democracy, and sometimes the, even the difference between these two things can get pretty thin, sort of depending mm -hmm. on what it is we're talking about and where we are. Uh, and the like. And it is, after all, these social democratic movements uh, that, that created societies in which everybody has health care and nobody is shut out and nobody is starving and everybody gets what they need and you have, and you have, uh, and you have parental care for 480 days and et cetera. I mean, just this list of things that is just normal in, in so much of Europe that just feels like the other side of the moon. Uh, in this country, so I, I am never one to disparage any of that. I want as much of all that um, as I can get. And yet, uh, I, th I think any kind of social democracy, or dem certainly democratic socialism, that isn't always fighting for as much economic democracy as it can get, has lost its soul. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that is my sort of problem with um, so much of, so many of my, uh, you know, friends uh, in the European context who just pre pretty much like what they've got already and they sort of lost any kind of a fighting spirit decades ago. Um, it's, it's hard not to notice when you, you go to Germany or elsewhere where they've, you know, they've got co-determination and they've got, they've got fully health care and they're just not interested in pressing uh, further and a lot of them seem to be happy with, uh, you know, four, four administrations in a row being a junior partner to the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. which now got them in power, right? They waited long enough, mm -hmm. uh, so now here they come back. No, I, I think I, I am not on that side of that aisle, and yet I, do, I have enormous respect for, for, for what social democ democracy has been able to achieve. And m the last thing I'll say about this, this goes to Bernie here. Bernie mm -hmm. did had a, have a social democratic um, strategy. This is all, this is, Partly always a question of judgment about what, what fails the test of incrementalism. That is, what is just too incremental to be radical, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we're, this is something that always has to, has to be tested. Um, but certainly to me and to Cornell, the Bernie campaign got, got clear of the bar. Uh, what Bernie did, uh, the way that he, he made this country deal with its severe inequality and change the language and change the Democratic Party, or at least made the Democratic Party deal with what it's supposed to be. 
Uh, that, I would not say that that's incrementalism. Although Cornell and I, you know, we have a dear friend, someone we, we respect very, very much, very important to us, Chris Hedges, that's just what he'd say. That is, that's just what he did say, right? Uh, that Bernie just flunks the test and that's just incrementalism and shame on you if you go, if you go over that. Um, well, I'm not for that. <laughs> no, but Chris tells some painful truths though, because he's concerned about the imperial backdrop. That's the thing about it. Bernie just said today what? I'm not voting for the military budget. Mm -hmm. $37 billion increase from the Trump budget. Bernie said no. He's getting in deep trouble. He's taking a principal stand because the militarism has to do with U.S. presence in Asia and Africa and the Middle East and Africa and, 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 and Latin America and so forth. So you can see, you know, looking at this from a variety of different perspectives as a, mm -hmm. who's paying the cost, who's being rendered invisible when even certain social democratic things like the Social Security Act under FDR, right, to exclude rural agricultural laborers and domestic maids, but that's 95 percent of black folk adjusting to the, the racist southern elites of the, of, of the Democratic Party coming out of the South. So what looks like so social democratic is to a certain degree in the world of vanilla folk. But when you look outside of those white zones, you see barbarism, lynching, Jim Crow, Jane Crow, oh, da, 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 all of the terror and the trauma that goes with white supremacist rule over precious black folk. So that it's that, that, that we need to Chris Hedges just to remind us, remind us of that on the global level. And of course, Brother Gary's written some of the best stuff on empire and economy and difference and white supremacy. So he's very mindful of it. No doubt about that. We had big fights over the Obama book. Oh, Lord, we have, we have lunch for six hours, so we get a whole lot in in our dialogue. Because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be much more harsh. You were just so analytically subtle and so kind. I said, no, you got to hit him, brother. <laughs> Not physically, but the, the points, his blind spots, because the least of these mm. in Harlem poor Appalachia, east side of Los Angeles, and in Latin America, the Middle East, and Africa. Though that's neoliberal rule with that friendly black face of the American empire that so many people fell in love with for the wrong reason. I believe we all love everybody, but for the right reason. And so in that sense, we, we, it, it, your critique was there. It was a progressive critique, but I thought, Oh, Gary, brother Gary, Lord, we need a longer lunch. We need a longer lunch. <laughs> well, speaking of lunch, um, this is, a, I think, a perfect question, um, considering that so many people will return um, to homes and to family members next week um, to be with one another. So this question is, and, and perhaps it's the last question of the evening, but how do we destigmatize social, socialism when talking about it with family and friends who are still so afraid of the S word. Are those conversations still worth having? And that seems a question that all three of you may want to take a stab at and perhaps have that be the last word for the evening. I would say just, I would just was not with it. Yeah. <laughs> I would say uh, just read Matthew. <laughs> talk talk about I mean it, it's interesting and around these political questions and this is why Gary's book is so important the Christian the Christian roots of democratic socialism are so evident on every page mm -hmm. and you shift the conversation to the Bible you open it up you start reading it there it is it's just right there uh -huh. and you take it out of the realm of of of, of, of heightened tensions around political partisanship and you, you get down to some basic discussions about what you value. Mm -hmm. um, well, I don't uh, regularly talk about democratic socialism with my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, although this is something that, you know, the fact that Bernie did make this fantastic intervention means that now 
these arguments and arguments about policy and getting into just every, everyday ordinary politics have now in, are now in a conversation in a way they weren't before, uh, where you are having to make some intervention or, or indeed have some, some scheme, some, some idea about how you would, um, you would try to even in, introduce this discourse for people who don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, and so for, for so long, of course, your con concern was just, was just to unpack the, all these hoary associations around with socialism. Um, and there's so much there that just has to be would have to be explained away or to say, no, I don't mean that because people have these associations in their mind for a good reason. I mean, that's, um, you know, the, the whole 20th century uh, had a history uh, with this that, that has to be talked about. I think the Bernie intervention has made a difference in the lives of many families sitting around the Thanksgiving table that now, you know, the democratic socialism is now um, in, a, in a, just has a broader, a bandwidth uh, than it did before so that you know so that you can you can have the discussion okay well, what would how is bernie a democratic socialist how is in fact what he was for mm -hmm. different than other democrats you have voted for or the like um how is there anything that he has in common with you know the other party or the like i mean i think he, he did at least um facilitate that um but uh I, well, I would admit it, uh, with regard to my, you know, very working class family from Michigan and then, and then from behind that, uh, a family from the UP that's part Native American and part, you know, very, um, very conservative, uh, fundamentalist. Um, you don't, you don't have, a, have a discussion about democratic socialism with them. Uh, what would be the point of that? No, you got to start in some, some place much closer to home. Yeah. Well, um, the Bible. Yes, uh, that there, there are there are people in my family. Certainly, that that's just what you go to. Uh, that that's that's where everything for them comes out of that. And usually, that's some kind of dispensationalist reading the Bible. So there, you're already in a code world. You know where 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 some scheme has already explained what what in fact the bible is and so to even to have a discussion about the bible yeah you'd need to talk about you know which of which of the derby stages are we in here and and, and the like because that, that's in fact how that works so yes if you're going to try to meet people on what it is that's important to them and then try to get to an argument um that tries to unpack some of that social ethical content that is in scripture which incidentally if you hadn't heard of george woodby before now Check him out. Woodby was absolutely brilliant at this. Um, he had marks in his head. He had Debs. He had all these people in his head. And yet, all he ever, when he would when he would speak to these issues, it was always just just out of the Bible, um, taking political questions um, and and giving sort of biblical answer. Just it was just ingenious um, what he did. Yeah. Well, you can imagine massive campaign of having on the walls of 85 percent of american churches jesus running out the money changers out of the temple every week they just look up and say what is jesus so upset about what is he running them out of the temple for well they're gonna put him on the cross after he runs them out and he's gonna be criminalized precisely because he constituted for this moment a threat to the elites of the day. Oh, interesting. Is that part of the story too? That's right. Take Michael <laughs> take Michelangelo's uncle off the, uh, off the window, the Italian looking Jesus, put a swarthy complexion and a Jewish brother up there. That's what he was. Then give an account for why he was executed, why he was crucified and what was behind it running them out so that's both a story that cannot be denied that has implications the ism issue for me you know as a christian i in the end all of these isms i wear like a loose garment you can you can do devilish things in the name of socialism you devilish things in the name of any ism 
You can do devilish things in the name of Christianity, devilish things in the name of Islam, devilish things in the name of Judaism, and so forth and so on. I want to know what on the ground is working that has to do with integrity, honesty, decency, service to the least of these, and the willingness to empower poor and working people. Put that at the center of your vision, your analysis, and your life. And once you do that, you can almost call it anything you want. New style feudalism, overthrowing corporate e greedy institutions or whatever you want to call it. You see? So in that sense, we don't want to get caught with the labels. Mm. We want to see what's happening on the ground in terms of the, the bonds, the organizing, the visions, the analysis. That's what is so magnificent about this text. It doesn't deal in the abstract. It tells those concrete stories. And that's the only way I think that we have a way. Because remember, Rosa Luxemburg says what? It's either socialism or barbarism. So she's saying what? If you really want to be afraid of a word, it's the F word, fascism. And anti-fascist activity takes a number of different forms. But behind fascism is always big money, big militarism, xenophobic public face. Black, brown, indigenous, Jews, Arabs, Muslims, and then trying to get folk to consent to the rule of big military, big mil money, and, and co-op the intellectuals so they become comfortable in their little silos as fascism unfolds. See, that's what is frightening, and that's where we are right now in a certain sense. Well, that would be the last word, but just for tonight, we're going to try to make our way into one of those six hour lunches because there's so much more to be said. And on behalf of all of us, those of us who are in the audience, those of us who are on Zoom, thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Jones, Professor Dorian, Professor West, we are so deeply appreciative, um, not only for writing this book, and in your seats, there is a, a code here. If you would like to purchase it, um, please do so. We have nameplates in the back that have already been signed uh, by Dr. Dorian, so you can grab a nameplate and buy the book and give it to that person during the holiday season who you may not be able to talk to. Maybe this would be just the gift of how to do this. So thank you. That's right. <laughs> applause, applause, applause. We practice so we can do this. Thank you. Please join us for a glass of wine, and Dr. Dorian will be here to answer any questions that we were unable to get to.